Hello, my name is Dr. Kimberly Green. I'm the Global Director for PASS HIV and TB Program, and I am delighted to be opening the pre-record session of Bringing PrEP Closer to Home, Why is Now the Time for Differentiated PrEP? This two-part session will focus on promising models of differentiated PrEP, as well as adaptations made in light of COVID-19. This satellite is co-sponsored by AVAX, HIV Prevention Market Manager, by PATH, by the International AIDS Society's Differentiated Service Delivery Team, and by USAID. So with the global goal of 3 million people with access to PrEP by the end of 2020, and only approximately 420,000 people having had taken PrEP at least once by the end of 2019, we're only at about 14% of the global target. So there remains much to be done in terms of increasing PrEP, PrEP access and uptake. So one of the ways to increase PrEP access and uptake is by differentiating PrEP service delivery models and by offering services that best meet the needs of populations who could benefit from PrEP. And so to that end, AVAC, the International AIDS Society, and PATH put out a request for uh, diversified PrEP models uh, in March of this year, and we received 50 submissions. Today, through this pre-record and also through the live session on July 6, you'll be hearing six of these models, and they reflect a range of differentiated models focusing on uh, telehealth, focusing on peer-led uh, delivery of PrEP, uh, as well as pharmacy-based services. So the building blocks of differentiated PrEP uh, revolve around adapting the when, where, who, and what of PrEP service delivery. So that includes uh, for the when, uh, looking at longer PrEP refills, for the where, uh, looking at ways to offer PrEP closer to home, such as through drop-in centers um, or by offering community-led services. The what, uh, looking at ways uh, to simplify PrEP uh, refill, such as through home delivery, for example. Uh, and then also um, the cadre of PrEP service uh, providers expanding beyond clinicians to include peers and community providers. So now as we look at PrEP service delivery, it's really critical um, to build uh, beyond uh, the most uh, dominant model now, which is uh, PrEP delivered through a uh, health clinic, uh, to PrEP services that may be offered through telehealth or virtual contact, that may be offered um, through home-based delivery and support, through peers, uh, or through pharmacies. Uh, and likewise, then, each step of the way um, for PrEP, from PrEP screening and initiation to PrEP monitoring and continuation, offering choice to clients. So, for example, for PrEP risk screening, uh, being able to support clients to self-assess themselves uh, for PrEP uh, risk and uptake, um, as well as uh, peers being able to offer guided risk assessment um, and or healthcare worker. So now looking at considerations for differentiated PrEP in the context of COVID-19, we've seen an acceleration of differentiated models. Um, there are a number of key factors to consider related to uh, safety and confidentiality for clients um, and keeping them safe related to COVID-19. So that includes number one, how to communicate, making sure that that clients are able to express the best way for them to maintain contact with PrEP services, either in person or virtually. Um, secondly, looking at flexibility in multi-month dispensing for new enrollment. So where possible, looking at that three-month supply for daily or event-driven prep to minimize the need for a clinic visit. And then for MSM, being able to provide support uh, to help MSM to um, transition as needed between daily ED prep or putting a pause on prep given circumstances of COVID-19 as well as looking at ways of making it easier for clients, like delivering PrEP ARVs or offering um, home lab sampling. And then lastly, um, making adherence support more robust for those whose schedules might have been disrupted by COVID-19. So with that, I am thrilled to introduce uh, the three country examples um, and presenters today. So the first is Fethia Keder from PSI uh, in Ethiopia. She's going to be presenting on uh, female sex worker peer-led PrEP. 
Um, following, uh, Nitya uh, Fanupak will be presenting um, from the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation. She will be presenting on bringing PrEP to key populations in Thailand. Uh, following, Saika Mulek from uh, WITS, uh, RHI in South Africa will be presenting on taking PrEP online, Project PrEP. And finally, uh, Anna Grimsrund from the International AIDS Society will be wrapping up the session with key takeaways. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending wherever you are. Uh, this is Dr. Fatia Kader. I'm uh, representing KSI Ethiopia. I'll be presenting on peer-led approaches for reaching female sex workers with PrEP in Ethiopia. So PrEP pil was piloted uh, in Ethiopia between December 2018 and September 2019 in selected drop-in centers. Drop-in centers are uh, specially designed uh, community clinics uh, for female sex workers to provide comprehensive HIV care and treatment services. PrEP services provided to HIV negative FSWs and discordant couples of HIV positive FSW. Uh, PSI as part of the national PrEP TWG is uh, supporting in the supported in development of training materials and MND tools. PSI also supported cascading of training to the regional health bureaus in collaboration with the uh, Ministry of Health. Uh, major approach to reaching female sex workers include uh, using client centered design. Female sex workers were fully engaged in the development of PrEP demand creation material for their peers. Uh, USAID Mulu Kepi activity has a community sexual and social networks for uh, peer educators to disseminate the demand creation message. Uh, client will uh, be screened for substantial risk at entry point and directed uh, through service option, including PrEP. Uh, what I mean by entry point is testing, uh, it could be outreach, DIC, or mini outreach testing. PrEP uh, early acceptors during the piloting periods were selected as ambassadors for demand creation. Uh, finally, after uh, HIV testing service, all HIV negative FSWs are uh, counseled for uh, PrEP. This slide uh, is, uh, shows the pre-COVID-19 building blocks of PrEP programming. Uh, it includes screening, PrEP initiation, initial follow-up uh, during uh, zero to three months and PrEP continuation uh, more than three months. The screening is done at entry point, that is a DIC and uh, outreach uh, testing. Uh, PrEP is initiated during the first visit. Initial follow-up is after one month. PrEP refill is every one month for the first three months and every three months afterwards. Routine clinical follow-up is uh, also given every one month for the first three months and then uh, three months afterwards. But clients can show up anytime if they uh, face any adverse uh, effects. Service is provided at drop-in centers, screening, uh, whereas screening is also given uh, at uh, outreach. Service providers include a trained ART provider and nurse counselor, lab and pharmacy personnel. Service package include counseling on combination HIV prevention, substantial risk screening, adherence counseling, HIV testing, and hepatitis B surface antigen testing. Uh, during PrEP initiation, same counseling package will be uh, provided, including uh, ARB side effects. Initial follow-up uh, at, at one month, we also provide the same counseling package, including HIV testing and risk reduction uh, counseling. Uh, during uh, PrEP refill, uh, same uh, package of counseling is provided, ARB side effects will be assessed. During routine clinical follow-up, uh, counseling uh, on combination HIV prevention, substantial screening, adherence counseling, assessing for sign and symptom of acute HIV infection, STI, ARV side effect, HIV testing will also be done uh, every three months. Uh, this slide shows uh, PrEP cascade uh, between October 2019 and uh, May 2020. We have screened 892 clients. Of this, 55% were eligible uh, uh, to start PrEP. However, we are arguing that this number is very low. So we are uh, screening uh, the most at least target groups, uh, that is, uh, female sex workers. Obviously, we're not uh, screening uh, uh, people like grandma, I'm just saying. Uh, we're also, uh, so of the eligible 88% uh, initiated PrEP, uh, 57 refused. Uh, so currently we have 370 clients, 60 discontinued. Uh, our, it's because uh, these clients are out of their substantial risk and they were retained for three 
or six months. Adaptation in light of COVID-19, uh, we're providing multi-month dispensing of PrEP for three months with monthly follow-up status, including adherence counseling uh, through phone call. Uh, we're also maintaining sufficient stock status uh, to avoid interruption of MMP for PrEP clients. Uh, recently, we're using cyber education to create awareness of PrEP and COVID-19 uh, among the target group. Earlier, we used to uh, provide education through small group discussion. We call this PCC session. It's called the P2 COVID-19. We also use index case testing as an entry point to screen all HIV negative plants uh, for PrEP enrollment during uh, COVID season. Uh, our major strategy for case identification is ICT, so we're using this opportunity to address uh, all HIV negative clients for PrEP enrollment. Uh, the other one is reinforcing uh, intimate partner violence screening and uh, where uh, we increase availability of PrEP among uh, GBV survivors. Uh, again, this level is the same, but this is after COVID, it's building blocks of baseline PrEP programming post COVID-19. Uh, basically, all the services the same, except the uh, follow-up is uh, during the, in the initial follow-up is after three months. Uh, for pre-COVID, it used to be every month. This time, we're for we're initial follow-up is after three months, including PrEP refill and routine clinical follow-up. Service is given uh, as DIC, as, uh, as uh, outreach activities is halted. We're not doing, we're not screening client at outreach. Service provider, uh, lab and pharmacy personnel are the one involved in providing PrEP service. Service package includes counseling on combination HIV prevention, substantial risk screening, adherence, uh, HIV testing, uh, hepatitis B surface antigen testing, and COVID-19 prevention message. Uh, the same counseling package uh, is uh, given uh, during PrEP initiation, including ART side effects. And uh, we do initial uh, follow-up after three months, so the testing is repeated uh, after three months. Uh, ART level is again after three months, including routine clinical follow-up. However, we uh, follow clients monthly through phone calls to assist their adherence status, uh, use of combination HIV prevention, risk reduction counseling uh, is done through phone call. Feedback on using a peer approach. Uh, clients are uh, confident that uh, using PrEP will prevent HIV infection while applying combination HIV prevention approaches, including good adherence. Peer approach avoids stigma and discrimination amongst each other. Uh, because peers are the most trusted people for most of the clients, they have a strong circle of influence. Peers know where to find uh, those who are the hardest to reach. Uh, those who are not being reached uh, by the system are picked uh, through their peers. Where uh, to from plans for the future? This is from COVID-19 to post-COVID-19. Uh, we're planning to uh, deliver PrEP uh, at home for those clients who cannot access uh, drop-in centers. Uh, we're also planning to support clients with regular home follow-up for routine clinical assessment and adherence. Uh, we will work with the National PrEP TWG to catalyze the market for PrEP distribution. Further, we'll develop digital solution for social and behavior change communication, demand creation, and uh, adherence uh, for PrEP. Major key learnings uh, include demand creation by peer educator, increase uh, the service uptick. Using uh, PrEP clients created confidence among the target group. Uh, we have also identified the counseling skill varies among uh, healthcare providers. Those with good counseling, with good attitude and commitment uh, have shown the, the screen versus eligible, uh, screen versus eligible uh, differences minimal as compared to those uh, with weak counseling, uh, we have uh, seen the difference, the gap between screen and eligible is maximum uh, because of uh, weak counseling techniques. So, because due, so we are giving continuous coaching, uh, technical assistance to improve the counseling skill of uh, providers. Thank you. This is all I have. Let me know if you have any question. Thank you for your attention.
I would like to thank the organizers for having me in this very interesting session. My name is Nithya Panupak, and I'm working at the Institute of HIV Research and Innovation, or IHRI, in Bangkok. Today, I'm going to share with you our experience doing the community-led delivery of PrEP for men who have sex with men and transgender people in Thailand. Our key population-led PrEP service delivery model is well known as the Princess PrEP program. It is a free same-day PrEP service uh, where PrEP is dispensed by key population lay providers. The main support to run this um, program mainly uh, has come from public donation to Princess Som Sawali Prevention Fund, uh, which was transformed from the PMTCT Fund, um, established more than 25 years ago by our princess. Um, who was just recently appointed the UNS Goodwill Ambassador for HIV Prevention in Asia Pacific. In the Princess PrEP um, service program, the KP lab providers provide PrEP counseling and then um, provide HIV um, and STI testing. And then they dispense PrEP based on the standing order and remote approval by doctors. They also um, um, provide all these services in PrEP follow-up visits. The Princess PrEP program is part of the Key Population-Led Health Services, or KPLHS. And in Thailand, we define KPLHS as a set of services designed by key populations, and therefore, they are needs-based, demand-driven, and client-centered. These services are delivered by trained and qualified lay providers who are mostly members of the key populations. The Princess PrEP program um, has contributed the largest PrEP data set um, shown in blue here to the country and has moved PrEP into the coverage under the Thailand Universal Health Coverage Program in October last year. However, the fund for PrEP under UHC during this first year, coupled with the country's unreadiness to fund KPLHS mean that the K Princess PrEP um, program will likely need to continue for the next few years. Um, the figure um, shown here um, also demonstrated that over more than five years of PrEP implementation in our country, we have now just reached 9% of the total um, PrEP target calculated based on the number of key populations who are at high risk of getting HIV. In 2018, KPLHS has contributed to 55% of HIV testing among key populations. And um, in this case, mainly um, they were MSM and transgender women. The KPLHS also contributed to 55% of um, PrEP users in that year, which uh, led to the legalization of KPLHS in 2019. Um, through the announcement of MOPH regulations, which allow KP lab providers to um, provide rapid or point of care testing for HIV and STIs, as well as to dispense PrEP, PEP, ART, and oral STI treatment. Looking at the building block of the Princess PrEP service, uh, we can see that before COVID-19 pandemic, um, the screening and initiation of PrEP happened on the same day in kp clinics by kp providers um, with um, remote prescription uh, uh, from doctors. Only uh, HIV and syphilis test results were available before PrEP uh, was dispensed, while the clients will receive um, their creatinine and other lab test results a few days uh, later. Initial follow-up um, happened at month three, month one and month three, um, and then every three months thereafter using the same building block, um, and syphilis and creatinine testing happened every six months. During COVID-19, um, the Princess PrEP service has continued with certain adaptations. Um, our KP-led providers in these KP-led clinics were not prioritized during PPE shortages, neither by our own government nor by their international funders. 
Um, therefore, the protective plastic shields and various types of um, protective box uh, panel or frame had to be created by um, these lay providers themselves. Telehealth, um, along with PrEP um, drug delivery, um, was rapidly set up um, together with express services aiming at the shortest time spent in the clinic just for sample collection, while the, uh, all the test results uh, for HIV and STIs uh, would be um, delivered to the clients via online platforms um, were become, um, um, uh, has become a very popular um, suddenly among our clients and providers. STI self-sampling also has shown to be uh, very feasible among our MSM and transgender women clients um, over these times. The PrEP effective use concept uh, was also introduced to our MSM clients um, in order to empower them to be able to tailor their PrEP use according to their risks um, especially during the first few months uh, that we um, experienced low PrEP stock and unstable supply chain. So after COVID, um, practices that will likely um, become the new normal additions to the building block of Princess PrEP service um, include telehealth and um, PrEP drug delivery uh, with potentially longer um, period for PrEP refill. Um, it uh, will also include express service, um, self-sampling for HIV and STI testing, and PrEP effective use counseling. So in summary, it has been very, very obvious um, that the key population-led health services designed and co-delivered by key populations has increased significantly HIV test uh, service uptake among MSM and transgender women over the past five years. In our country, the KP-led free same-day PrEP service is the main delivery model to scale up PrEP. And although KP-led providers are now legalized to dispense PrEP in KP-led clinics um, in our country, the service still could not be reimbursed and there um, are much more advocacy work and activities um, to do. And lastly, longer than three months scripting, telehealth, express service, self-sampling, and PrEP effective use counseling will likely become the new normal. I'd like to end by acknowledging all Thai people who are the main funder of this Princess PrEP program, as well as other funders and implementers. Thank you very much for listening to this talk. I'd like to thank AVEC, HARP, and the International AIDS Society for the opportunity to participate in this exciting panel on bringing PrEP closer to home, why diversifying service delivery matters, particularly in the era of COVID. My name is Saika Malik. I'm Director of Implementation Science at the Vets Reproductive Health and HIV Institute. And I'd like to share some experience from our unit aid funded project implemented in South Africa. And the project is called Project PrEP. To start with, I'd like to give you a brief overview of Project PrEP, which is a project implemented um, in, in 2018. And it was aimed at strengthening demand, uptake and retention for comprehensive HIV prevention services, including oral pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. We work closely with the South African National Department of Health and target adolescent girls and young women, AGYW, aged 15 to 24 in high priority areas. The three overarching objectives of the project are to increase accessibility of PrEP for eligible AGYW through developing and implementing strategies to reach young women at high risk, Secondly, to demonstrate and test effective service delivery models. And finally, to generate and disseminate evidence on the use of PrEP in real life settings. To date, the program has initiated over 8,000 individuals on PrEP and over 4,000 of them are adolescent girls and young women. So how is service delivery happening pre-COVID? 
we had active community engagement, both online, balanced with face-to-face -face community engagement to inform and engage people and to link people to services. We held events for youth and interested clients were linked to more information and to fixed or mobile services to provide testing and assess eligibility for PrEP. PrEP initiation visits were conducted at either a fixed or a mobile health facility with follow-up at one month and at each three month interval thereafter also being conducted at the facility. In line with South African guidelines, PrEP pickup was done every month and continued engagement and encouragement for follow-up was done by telephone and WhatsApp. When the national lockdown was announced on March 26, we were prohibited from conducting group engagements, both in communities and at facilities. The National Department of Health distributed guidance, stressing that provision of prevention services was an essential service to be continued during lockdown. This was very enabling guidance as it also made suggestions on how these services might be implemented under lockdown rules. The guidance stipulated that face-to-face -face social mobilization activities were curtailed, but online and other platforms to continue demand creation were encouraged. New clients were not to be denied these services and return clients were to be provided with two months of multi-month dispensing of PrEP drugs if stock permitted. Clinics needed to be supported to decongest by arranging alternate pickup points and continued follow-up support on phone and WhatsApp. Infection control processes had to be in place at all service delivery points and implementing partners were encouraged to continue to support and capacitate providers, m and &E requirements for PrEP delivery remained in place. So what adaptations were made to the project PrEP service delivery model? Being unable to hold face -to large face-to-face -face consultations, we intensified our measures for reach and engagement online through our Facebook and Twitter and myprep.co.za national website. We integrated information related to COVID as youth began to engage and ask questions not only about PrEP, but also about COVID. We updated our online chatbot to also provide COVID information and support um, and to support clients' questions. We prepared facilities by providing staff with appropriate PPE, and we conducted a series of online trainings for our staff in the new Department of Health guidance in COVID information, infection prevention, and facility zoning. We also worked with each of our facilities to identify service delivery outreach hotspots. The locations of our mobile units at these hotspots were communicated in advance online and through WhatsApp groups to let clients know where services would be. Online communication was also geared towards driving clients to facilities or reaching out to ascertain where there was a need for medication drop-off. We developed job aids for providers and IEC materials for clients to assist with integrated messaging and to encourage uptake and continuation of PrEP, ART and sexual and reproductive health services. And we downscaled any face-to-face -face engagements with clients presenting at clinics or outreach spots to either small group discussions with appropriate social distancing measures in place or one-to-one -one interaction. This slide shows online engagement and reach pre-lockdown into the lockdown and post-lockdown period through our various social media platforms. And you can see that there was a huge surge in both the reach and in engagement during lockdown indicating a demand for information. 
So what changed in the service delivery model in light of COVID? As I mentioned, the use of online platforms to communicate about service availability, including when, where, and the mobile clinic schedule. We integrated COVID messaging into client education materials and messaging, including IEC materials, chatbots, and all social media were updated. We decentralized service delivery to decongest facilities. Initially, mobile clinics were parked outside of fixed uh, facilities, allowing clients to access sexual and reproductive health services without having to enter the clinic. With additional time, external medicine pickup points were identified and patients were registered for prep delivery. New client hotspots were identified where people went to buy groceries or pick up food parcels or receive social security grants during this period. We continued to conduct health talks on HIV testing and adherence to ARD, SRH, PrEP, and we integrated COVID information in, within these talks at both the clinic and non-clinic sites in the community. In rural settings, our clinics, uh, our mobile clinics uh, drove around demarcated areas, loud hailing and handing out promotional flyers about SRH services, including PrEP. Infection prevention and control were done through providing all sites with PPE and training staff on cleaning protocols through zoning and triaging at fixed and mobile clinics to minimize COVID-19 risk for both staff and clients. We also strengthened remote retention and follow-up mechanisms. Based on reports of increased GBV and mental health issues, we increased GBV and mental health awareness and information sharing and included information on appropriate helplines and resources. And we directly supported COVID-19 activities risk communication and community education. I'd like to present some project data over this time period. Prior to the lockdown, we communicated with clients urging them to come to facilities to collect medication prior to the lockdown. This is seen in the pre-lockdown surge in this graph which was followed by a precipitous decline in uptake as we implemented the strategies and, 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 and some of the restrictions were lifted, we began to see the uptake of testing and PrEP initiations for AGYW rise slowly. Sexual and reproductive health services showed a similar pattern. And this pattern was seen for other clients as well. This included older women, men, and boys. PrEP follow-up visits did see a decline during lockdown, with adolescent girls and young women seeing larger declines than other groups, but overall continuation rates were less affected, indicating the strategies to support continuation may have been effective. This slide shows data from a number of sites showing that intensified telephonic follow-up helped to assist with continuation. So what have we learned? We've learned through this experience that online platforms needed to be leveraged rapidly. We learned that initiation and continuation rates were seriously affected by initial lockdown, the hard lockdown phase. Um, however, we pivoted rapidly in response to changing situations and rapidly, uh, rapidly strengthened communication, which was key both internally with our staff, but also with our clients during the pivoting. We intensified follow-up, uh, telephone follow-ups and decentralized approaches, which have proved successful in bringing clients into services and keeping them coming back. We also have learned that integrated service delivery can continue and that there is a demand for such services even during lockdown periods. Thank you. 
Thank you very much to the great presenters who shared their firsthand experiences of PrEP programs in Ethiopia, South Africa, and Thailand, and how they were adapted to meet the needs of their clients during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Dr. Anna Grimsrud from the International AIDS Society, and I will share now some key takeaways as a wrap up to this pre-recorded session. As many of you know, there have been substantial gains made towards reaching HIV testing and treatment targets. However, progress towards the goal of reaching 3 million people globally with PrEP by 2020 lags behind. Data cited in the Global AIDS Report from UNAIDS at the end of 2019 noted that 300,000 people worldwide had taken PrEP at least once in 2018, which is just 10% of the target for 2020. And so PrEP is at a critical juncture. How can we innovate and adapt to ensure we make timely progress towards increasing the number of people on PrEP? One place to look is differentiated service delivery and differentiated antiretroviral therapy delivery in particular. First endorsed by the World Health Organization in 2016, DSD is a client-centered approach. It simplifies and adapts HIV services across the cascade of HIV care to reflect the preferences and expectations of various groups of people living with or at risk of acquiring HIV while reducing unnecessary burdens on the health system. Prior to DSD, the delivery of ART was one size fits all with monthly visits to clinicians at healthcare facilities. Today, millions of people living with HIV are receiving their treatment, care and support through a differentiated ART delivery model, including the group models, such as healthcare worker managed groups in orange here, such as adherence clubs, and client managed groups shown here in green, including community ART groups. Further, there are individual models shown in red that can happen at health facilities and outside in communities, such as fast track models, community pharmacies, private pharmacies, ART refills from drop in centers and community drug delivery points, and home delivery. Let's compare how services are provided for the adherent person living with HIV and the adherent PrEP user. The person living with HIV is eligible for, eligible for three to six month ART refills from outside of a clinic, support from peers, and receives a six monthly or even clinical annual clinical consultation. Meanwhile, the adherent PrEP user is likely in a very medicalized model with frequent clinical consultations and the need to return to the clinic for PrEP refills. So let's imagine what can be done to make PrEP access easier. We need to look at the building blocks of service delivery or the who, what, where, and when of PrEP delivery. Differentiated PrEP could involve adaptations of each of these building blocks. We could adapt the when with less frequent clinical monitoring, adapt the where to include community-based refills, adapt the who to ensure support by other health cadres, and adapt the what to make sure comprehensive services are offered. As we saw in the presentations, COVID-19 has afforded us the chance to utilize a pivotal opportunity and to change how PrEP services are provided. And so we must take this opportunity to pause and to think about the adaptations that were made because of COVID-19 and which of these could and should be sustained and supported going forward. As is stated on this slide here, in the rush to return to normal, consider which parts of normal are worth rushing back to. And so, in conclusion, let's leverage this opportunity, opportunity to ensure differentiated PrEP delivery. Change is needed to reach targets and ensure improvements in access and making it simpler for people to continue using PrEP. We can learn from adaptations made to antiretroviral therapy delivery and from other health programs such as family planning. In many instances, changes made due to COVID-19 may offer benefits beyond the pandemic. And so let's go forward together, ensuring we don't backtrack, but sustain our gains. Thank you.